your blood. Power in your blood. Think about the words that you sing on the first. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power, wonder working power in the blood of Jesus. We'll sing it on the very first.
Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we just want to thank you once again for gathering us here as we worship you. And Lord, help us to humbly give you all the glory and honor. And we thank you once again for bringing a preacher here uh, to speak to us this morning. I pray that you would just empower him and speak through him your word, Lord, and speak to each and every one of our hearts. Help us to remain faithful unto you. Help us to be obedient unto you, Lord. I pray that you would just work in our hearts this morning. Pray that everything that we do this morning would glorify and give you all the glory and honor. We thank you once again for this day, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Just a couple of announcements. First of all, we just want to welcome here uh, to our church. Uh, if this is your first time or you've been attending our church for several weeks or you've been a long-time member, uh, whichever it is, we want to encourage you to fill out the connection card, the connect card inside your bulletin. There's several things inside your bulletin. I'll be going over all of them in just a minute. But uh, inside your bulletin, there's a connect card. If you just want to fill that out, let us know more about you. If you have a prayer request or you'd like to volunteer for any ministries or you want to sign up for any of our upcoming events, fill that out. Drop it off at the uh, connect table over there on your back or at the offering plates at the back as well. You can also fill it out online at visitmailfest.org uh, forward slash connect. Inside your bulletin, you're going to also find one other thing that's important. And uh, it's actually a prayer partner card. And I'll be going over this in just a second. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to also encourage you and let you know that there are three ways to give. Giving is part of worship, and we want to make sure that we uh, give God all the glory through our giving this morning. And if you want to give, first of all, you can give at the offering place at the back. Second of all, you can give by mailing it to our church office. And then third of all, you can give it through our Easy Tithe app. Uh, you should have an envelope inside your bulletin as well if you want to give in person. So if you want to give, uh, be sure to do that as well. But inside your bulletin, there is a prayer partner card. And what will be starting up uh, very shortly, actually starting next week, is... There are several prayer meetings that's going to start up in the next couple of weeks now. And what you might be wondering, what is the prayer meetings about? First of all, we want to pray for the pastoral search. Uh, as many of you know by now, obviously, we are looking for a senior pastor. And we want to pray uh, that God would send the right person. We need to be a praying church. We need to be a church that prays for the right person to come. It's one thing to just search for somebody, but if we're not praying uh, for our church and praying for the right man to come, uh, then we don't know who exactly will come. And we want to make sure that uh, we pray and seek the Lord and what God's will is for our church first uh, before we look for any candidates, etc. And also through our prayer meetings, uh, the prayer leader will give you any updates regarding our pastoral search from our pulpit committee, uh, so on. So there are several prayer meetings that will be going on. First of all, uh, we'll, we'll be having a church-wide prayer meeting every Sunday morning at uh, 9.30, right here at Vandermola Elementary School. If you'd like to gather together, if you're volunteering that way, it's better for you to come earlier anyway. Uh, so if you want to come at 9.30 and pray corporately as a church, uh, join us every Sunday morning at 9.30 right here. We'll gather together, we'll share some prayer requests, we'll give you a, a sheet of paper also that includes all the prayer requests for the church, including our pastoral search, including our building. We're still praying for a building, amen? And uh, we want to make sure that we continue to pray for our church uh, together uh, and uh, with one another. So we'll partner up uh, every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. And then we also have two groups that's going to be going on during the week. We're going to have a men's prayer group, and then we're also going to have a women's prayer group. And both of those will be led by the Perilla family, and uh, Sean and Cassie are back there right now. Uh, and they'll be leading our men and women prayer groups. If you have any questions on when that will be, uh, go ahead and speak with them. They'll, uh, they'll have that list together for you. If you want to sign up, uh, I think Katie said, uh, I, I think Katie over there made uh, amazing sign-up sheets for you guys. So if you want to sign up, go ahead and go to the back table and uh, go ahead and sign up. And uh, if you're a man, obviously the men's prayer group and the woman to the women's prayer group. And that will be taking place during the week. It will be a good time of fellowship after. So I want to encourage you to sign up for uh, either three of those. And then inside your bulletin, you have a prayer partner card. What this is, is if you cannot make any of those meetings, maybe you're unable to, maybe at work, or maybe uh, it's just a little bit difficult for you, or maybe if you're just honest, it's a little bit hard to wake up that early. Uh, so if you're unable to do so, but would like to be a part of the church and pray, uh, I'm gonna encourage you to sign up on this card and drop it off at the connect table or at the offering place. Uh, just go ahead and put your name, your phone number, and your email address, 
And uh, once we compile this list together, we'll partner you with somebody, we'll give you their phone number or email, and uh, you two can figure out when you wanna uh, call each other, Zoom, or meet in person and pray together for our church. And we'll give you a list also digitally of what to pray for. And we wanna be a praying church, and uh, the Bible says to pray without ceasing. And that we want to make sure that everything that we do, ultimately, that we seek God's will and we seek the Lord above anything else. So we want to make sure that we are a praying church and uh, God will bless our church tremendously as, as long as we seek him first above anything else. So uh, that's inside your bulletin. Another announcement, August, uh, August uh, 7th, oh, I'm sorry, August the 1st, next Sunday, we have our Hawaiian Sunday. If you want to dress up in your tropical apparel, whichever that you have and you want to come uh, with a lei or something, we'll have some leis provided hopefully. And uh, next Sunday is Hawaiian Sunday, so please join us. Invite a friend uh, for the special theme Sunday. It's going to be an awesome Sunday. Uh, all of us will be in our Hawaiian apparel, so it's going to be awesome. And maybe we'll get some snacks and refreshments and some pineapples, etc. Uh, so it'll be a great Sunday. So that's going to be taking place next Sunday. Also, uh, the following Sunday on August the 8th, we'll be starting our World Impact Missions Emphasis Month. And I just spoke with our missionaries that are coming through. We have uh, two missionaries that's coming through, the Vincent family and then also the Bundy family. And uh, they'll be coming through uh, to present their ministries, respective ministries. And then we'll also be having uh, the way uh, 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 Pastor Dwayne Graves uh, from Tulare, California, uh, that'll be coming. And as many of you know, we support Pastor Graves already and his ministry there in Tulare, uh, Shiloh Baptist Church. So he'll be coming to speak to us. And uh, I'm also excited to have Dr. Jim Shepler uh, from West Coast Baptist College speak, for, uh, speak to us on the final Sunday. So let me encourage you to just pray for our Missions Emphasis Month and uh, to be a part of every Sunday. Every Sunday, it will be a special Sunday, and we want to encourage you to join us. And then also, we'll let you know about our international buffet. It's not going to be a box that we're giving out like the drive-in last year, but we're going to have an actual potluck buffet at the house, at the church office. So I want to encourage you to pray about these events. And mark your counts. We have a lot of things happening in the month of August. All of that's on our website and inside your bulletin. I know it's a lot, but if you, have, if you can try to keep along with it and mark it, that would be great. And then we have our summer youth camp that's coming up, and that's coming up on August 2nd to the 5th. I'm excited about that because this is our biggest youth camp ever uh, this year. We have about uh, 13 that are registered from our church, and then 17 from the other church that are registered. And uh, we're still uh, getting some uh, notifications from some of our members and our church families here that they still want to uh, consider coming to the youth camp. So we can have a large number uh, for uh, 6 to 12 graders that are coming to this year's camp. There will be an important meeting. There is an important meeting right after the service, right here on this section. We'll have a quick uh, informative meeting for each, uh, each of you regarding what's happening, when you need to drop off your teenager, when you need to pick them up, and then also the cost, and then also some requests. If you're able to, we need two areas of help. If you're able to, uh, first of all, we need drivers. Uh, we need drivers. Uh, with the amount of teenagers that we're going up with, we need one additional driver. So if you're able to drive, and if you have a larger vehicle, uh, we don't want a compact, uh, you know, Scion XA car because, you know, the teens will complain about that car. But we want a larger vehicle, so if you're able to help with driving us, it's about one hour to uh, two hours to get to Frazier Park. Uh, it's a little bit north of Santa Clarita. So if you're able to do so on Monday and Thursday, either one of those days, please let us know. Uh, that would be a tremendous blessing. Also, we need some chaperones. Um, with the amount of teenagers that we're having, we're, having, we're gonna have about 20 to 25 to even 30 teenagers. And so far, we have uh, very limited numbers of chaperones. So if you're able to, you don't have to come every single day. Uh, we have several chaperones that's coming from our church and also their church. Uh, that are going to be there for every single day. Uh, but if you're able to join us on either Tuesday or third or Wednesday, uh, that will be a blessing. You can carpool with somebody if you'd like, uh, but if you can help with the camp, it will be a tremendous blessing. We need all the help. We're a little bit limited. Uh, the other youth pastor, Robert Yap, uh, his wife gave birth a couple weeks ago, uh, so she's unable to attend the camp. So if you're able to, especially if you're a lady, if you're able to, we only have one lady counselor at the time going, so if you could join us, that would be a blessing. So if you are able to, please join us for the meeting right after the service. That would be a blessing. We also have a men's conference 
we don't have a slide for that, or nor is it on the bulletin, but it, it's just been brought up to our attention. We have a men's conference that our church will be attending. It's going to be held at Victory Baptist Church in Chino, uh, California, Pastor Brian Patterson. Uh, so if you're able to join us, it's on August the 13th to the 14th. It's Friday uh, to Saturday, Friday night at 6 p.m. It will be a uh, uh, dinner provided, a barbecue dinner provided. I was told it was delicious by Pastor Patterson. And then also a delicious breakfast that morning at 9 a.m. on Saturday. If you're able to join us, the cost is $10. You can make that payment on our website. You can register at visithillprince.org uh, forward slash events. So uh, we'll have that announcement and sign-up sheet at the back next Sunday. But if you're able to, please join us for that. And then uh, those are the main announcements that I have for you this morning. And one final announcement that I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're willing, if you want to get baptized, if you've been to our church, and obviously with COVID, we haven't had baptism, but we will be resuming our baptism. And I'm excited because we have several people that will be baptized on August the 8th. And the Sunday, August the 8th, if you want to get baptized, uh, and you know, you're both, you uh, made a decision to trust Christ and you want to make that public profession of faith instead with your obedience to God, uh, please talk to me or please talk to one of the board members uh, regarding baptism. And that's going to be taking place Sunday, August the 8th, uh, right outside. We're going to bring the nice, super, super cold uh, baptismal pool uh, that's going to be refreshing. If you want to jump in after, we're not going to baptize you, but if you want to jump in after, that's up to you. But especially on a hot day, but please, incur, uh, please, if you want to get baptized, speak to us after, and uh, also uh, we have several teens and adults that are going to be baptized that Sunday, so we want to encourage you to be there for that. It's also the start of our missions month. So once again, that's a lot of announcements, but it's good. Isn't it good that our church, we have a lot of things happening, and uh, continue to pray for our church, pray for a lot of the events, and you might think August has a lot, but don't worry, September will have more. So we're excited uh, so for all of that. So let me encourage you to pray for our church and to join us for especially those prayer meetings. Uh, pray for the pastoral search, etc. Let's all stand. We're going to sing one final song. Uh, Behold our God. And teenagers, 7 to 12 years, you're dismissed after the Bible scene. You can follow Cherry. We'll sing Behold our God. A great song to sing this morning. We'll sing it on the first.
teams are dismissed. Uh, but if you'd like to volunteer, we need some volunteers to help uh, with the greeting and the, I'm sorry, with specifically the ushering and the children and the, the setup and the teardown. If you're able to do so, please talk to me after. Uh, setups at Friday at 5 p.m. So if you're able to help us, join us. And then, uh, yes, they're dismissed. We're so excited to have uh, Brother Toby England with us. He's the professor at West Coast Baptist College, teaching at the Bible and the apologetics department there. And uh, he's been there for more than 10 years, and uh, he was one of my professors. I think several classes, apologetics, science and faith, and I think it was Romans. One of, I think he taught Romans, I'm not sure. Uh, it's one of those classes uh, that I mean, it was about several years ago now. So, uh, but I'm ex uh, we're excited to have him join us and uh, he's a great preacher, and we're excited uh, to have him uh, preach uh, God's Word this morning. And uh, I want to encourage you uh, to not only welcome him, but also to speak to him after the service. He'll be uh, at the back after the service, and make sure you greet him, let him know, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, just how, uh, it, uh, just get to know him, and it'll be a great blessing. Uh, but at this time, uh, Brother Toby England is going to come, and uh, let's welcome him from our church this morning. Okay, appreciate that. Have a seat. Uh, thank you so much for the warm welcome. I felt the moment I uh, walked in the building uh, with some of the people here early, making sure everything was set up, and uh, some of the ushers, and obviously uh, Brother K, and uh, the whole team. Man, you guys have a great crew here, and I get the sense that uh, this has been a crazy year. It's been crazy for everybody, but man, it's been crazy at Hillcrest, uh, from the building to the parking lot, and back in the building. I've been kind of... Uh, what do you call it on social media? When someone's kind of is it lurking or uh, I've been kind of watching what your church has been going through and praying for you, and I'm just excited to be able to be here and to meet many of you and to see what God's doing in this needy area. And certainly is a pleasure for me. I trust that uh, your time with us this morning will be enjoyable and beneficial. As was said, uh, if you're here and you're a guest or a new addition here to Hillcrest, make sure that they have the ability to follow up and uh, get in contact with you. I know that'll benefit you and everyone involved. Brother Kane's right, there was a lot of things going on here at Hillcrest. I thought I don't have to keep track of all of them. I had them written down here, and uh, there are many things to be in prayer for, and a lot of things that are exciting to me, just kind of being here for this morning only, but it's exciting to see what God's doing and not only is there activity going on, but we have, in our lives individually, a calling, a purpose, the Holy Spirit for every child of God. And that's really where the real work happens, isn't it? I'd invite you to join me this morning in Hebrews chapter number 10, if you have a scripture. Uh, if not, I'll be reading it. Hebrews chapter 10 is the passage where we'll be this morning. There are so many things that I love about scripture. And so many different uh, books and different messages that we have throughout the Word of God. One of the important things in every passage, whenever you open a passage, you want to generally know uh, who this passage is written to. For example, if you're reading the epistle to Timothy, that epistle is written to Timothy, right? There's a city that the book of Romans was written to. What was that city? That was Rome, right? Uh, there's a region that the book of Galatians was written to. There's a region called Galatians. When we get to the book of Hebrews, this book is written to a type or a demographic or an ethnic group of people. Guess who the book of Hebrews was written to? If you said Hebrews, you got an A so far today, all right? This is a book written to the Hebrew people, written to the Jewish people, and it's written to those that had become saved, the, the Jewish believers, and they were going through some trial, and they were going through some struggle, and there were people that were trying to draw them away out of the faith. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever seen that? Somebody trying to draw someone away out of the faith, and that's what's going on here in Hebrews, and we want to begin in chapter number 10. In verse number 19, the Bible says, Therefore, our having therefore, brethren, boldness, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, 
Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful to promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we've come before you already today, but Lord, this is my first time publicly, and as we open your word, we ask for your presence, we ask for your spirit, we, uh, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us together. I thank you for um, my pastor, uh, Dr. Chapel, for my friend, uh, Brother Kang, and just the opportunities that worked out for me to be able to be here. Thank you for each individual that's here today and that is in the nursery and the youth group and the children's uh, classroom. We just pray that you would work and meet with us this morning. We promise you all the glory. I pray that you would help us to open your scripture and to open our hearts. And Lord, that you would accomplish that which you desire. And as we said, Father, it is to you that we'll give all the glory. We thank you for dying for us for giving us salvation, for giving us a hope, a purpose in this time in which we live. I pray that we live toward that. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Well, as we work through this passage, we see this incredible passage of Scripture, and it begins with several things right out of the gate. Verse number 19, as I was reading that a moment ago, I noticed that it begins with this action. And this action is that we can enter. Did you see that in verse number 19? Having, therefore, brother, in boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now let's back up and recall who this passage is written to. The people group that was the intended audience primarily were Jewish people, Hebrew people, right? What does it mean if you're a Hebrew, if you're a Jewish person, if you're practicing the Jewish faith, and somebody refers to the holiest? Or the holy area. Well, this is a part of the temple. Now, if you were to walk into the temple, you have, or the tabernacle prior to that, you would have this, this wall around. And, and not everybody could just go into the temple. In fact, only a certain few people could go into the temple. If you wanted to go into the temple, and you lived in the Old Testament, number one, you had to be a Jewish person. Because no non-Jews were allowed to go into the temple. No Gentile was ever allowed to go into the temple. It was exclusively for Jewish people. So if you, like me, aren't Jew, I wouldn't have been allowed. If you're in the Old Testament, you wanted to go to the temple, number one, you had to be a Jew. Number two, you had to be a guy. Could be a girl. You had to be a dude. You had to be a man in the Jewish context because only they, they had an outside court for the Gentiles and an outside court for the women. But if you wanted to go in, you had to be a Jew and you had to be male, but once you got in, there was the, the altar, and there was some of the furniture you could see, but then there was a separate building. And that separate building was the holy area. And if you were a Jew, and if you were a man, you still weren't allowed access to that. Because guess who got to go in there? That was just the priests. Just the descendants of Levi. That was just the people that were there helping with the sacrifices and wearing the robes and the ephod and the priestly garb. Only the priests were allowed to go into that holy area. But in the holy area, there was a diviner. In the tabernacle, this huge curtain that separated the front part of it from the holiest part of the back. Can we remember what was in the holiest part? It was the Ark of the Covenant. And the mercy seat and the, the images of the cherubims. And that is the, the holiest place ever where the Shekinah glory of God was. And guess what? One person, one day a year, ever got to go there. This was the most exclusive point on the planet. Because you had to be a Jewish person, you had to be a male, you had to be a priest, you had to be the high priest, and today had to be Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Only one day of the year was the high priest of all of the descendants of Levi able to go into the holiest 
So when I read verse number 19, I just read, yeah, we can enter in the holiest. But if you were a Jewish person, I think that would take your breath away. You ever have somebody dump cold water on you or something that just kind of took your breath away? You almost had a close call driving and all of a sudden your heart's racing. And I think if you're a Jewish reader and you read that we were able to go into the holiest area, there'd be something that would catch in your breath because that's not where you're allowed to go. But the passage says we can. I want you to feel from a Jewish perspective the importance of this action that we can enter into the holiest. I see this action. There's an attitude there. Look at verse number 19. It says, having therefore boldness. I don't know some of you in this room. You're naturally bold. How are you sitting by somebody that's naturally bold? You don't have to have a one, but, uh, or maybe you are, and you know that you are. Maybe you know somebody that they're just naturally bold. And then other people, you're not naturally bold. Maybe you tend to be a little more shy. But regardless, we all, I think, have had this situation. Has this happened to you where you had this conversation, maybe it was a, a tension. You ever have a conversation you have to have, and you know it's not going to be pleasant, and you got this little knot in your stomach. Does that happen to somebody else? Like when the boss says, hey, when you clock out today, come by and see me in my office. You know, those kind of conversations, and then for the next four hours, you're like, you just don't feel good physically. So have you ever had this where it's one of those, like, tense conversations, and you, 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 you have this maybe even a, a, a exchange of words? Or and have you ever walked out and you realize, like, five minutes later, you know what I should have said? You ever have those too late epiphanies, like they always come a couple minutes after the conversation ended, you're like, you hung up the phone, you're like, why didn't I say? You know what happens in the moment? We lack boldness or we lack clarity of thought. There's a hesitation. There's a, uh, a timidness. There doesn't seem like maybe we're thinking uh, as sharply as we sometimes could because there are situations where I think all of us lack a little bit of boldness. If you're a private, you're called in to maybe give an account before a, a ranking officer. If you're maybe a, 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 a new recruit at a police force, you're called in to uh, give an account of something you did to the sergeant or whatever. You're a new hired teacher. You've got to go talk to the, the principal. Whatever the situation, there are moments when we're not bold, when we're a little bit scared. Because we're not sure if we're good enough, we're not sure if we did it right, we're not sure if we're going to know what to say. Can you imagine the attitude that would be appropriate in approaching the Almighty God? What level of nervousness, what amount of hesitation would be appropriate if you were going to enter the holiest? You know what Hebrew says? The appropriate attitude is bold. How on earth can I enter into the holiest? <laughs> How on earth can I go boldly before God? Well, of course, the passage tells us, doesn't it? Verse number 19 tells us, Having therefore, brother, in boldness to enter into the holiest, there it is by the blood of God. Of Jesus. That's our access. That's how we have the ability to enter into the holiest, to have this conversation with God. In fact, he carries on that theme in verse number 20, verse 19. He says, having therefore that boldness by the blood of Jesus, verse number 20, by a new and a living way which he consecrated for us through his flesh. Verse 21, he says, and having a high priest. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's giving this foundation. This is one long sentence here. This, this, these thoughts build on something, but here's the foundation. The foundation is basically, sum it up, it's, it's because of Jesus. Quick personal story. When I was 15 years old, the year was, if I did my math right, 1998, and I was living in Minnesota, a little tiny town in the woods of Minnesota. And I was a pastor of a church, and uh, I was just, just a regular teenager, I suppose, growing up in a very rural context. And I didn't pay a lot of attention to politics. Sometimes I still don't or try not to. But that year in Minnesota, we had a, a Democrat running for our governorship. We had a 
Republican running, and then we had this guy that no one had ever heard of, this third party guy. His name was Jesse Ventura. And I don't know, some of you maybe remember Jesse Ventura. He was a Navy SEAL at one point in his life, and then he went into pro wrestling, you know, he was on TV, and he has these, you know, bulging muscles everywhere, no way he'd fit this uh, uh, suit I'm wearing today. And, and, and he had long hair and a goatee, and, and, and the attitude to match. And this pro wrestler with muscles everywhere, this, this big bodybuilder just decided to go into politics, and he won. That November, Jesse Ventura won the gubernatorial race in Minnesota. Here's what's me. So the Republicans went home, they were sad. Democrats went home, they were sad. And we had Jesse Ventura as our governor, who knew nothing about governing a state. Absolutely nothing. He can body slam you, he can put you in a chokehold, he can do all of that. He knew nothing about governing the state. But you know what he was? He was a big, bad looking guy. He's not the kind of guy you usually expect to be governing a state. And within, you had to, I don't know if anybody lived in Minnesota at that time, but within about a week and a half, you saw bumper stickers that people were putting on their cars, people were wearing t-shirts, pants, hats, and they, they had this phrase on it, this slogan, for like four years in Minnesota, I saw this everywhere, this is what it said, my governor can beat up your governor. <laughs> I don't know why that was a big deal to us. You know, I don't know why that, that, that doesn't really, that's a, not a great claim to fame, I suppose, for your governor. But, but we're kind of proud of it. My governor can beat up your governor. And by the way, it doesn't matter what state you were from. You're from Washington, it doesn't matter. My governor can beat up your governor. This, by the way, before uh, we had Schwarzenegger in California, that might have been a matchup, right? But uh, this was, it didn't matter if you're from Maryland or Texas or Tennessee or Pennsylvania. It doesn't matter who your governor is. My governor can beat up your governor. This kind of fun, he was kind of fun, and he was in the uh, gubernatorial mansion there for a couple of years. But that attitude reminds me a little bit of the attitude of this book of the writer of Hebrews. The attitude of the writer of Hebrews is, not my governor, the, the focus of this book is Jesus Christ. And here's the message of Hebrews. Sometimes I'll be honest, Hebrews is one of those books that I have hard time getting my mind around. This is, the, this is the main point of Hebrews. Jesus is better than fill in the blank. Jesus is better than the Old Testament prophets. Jesus is better than the law of Moses. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than the temple. Jesus is better than the sacrificial system. Jesus is better than Moses. And it, it really, if you think about it, go home and read this afternoon, chapter after chapter after chapter, the theme is Jesus is better. No matter what, and the writer of Hebrews compares Jesus with the angels and the prophets and the law and the sacrifice and the temple and Moses. And, and that really was what Hebrews is. And he contrasts Jesus with all of these different things. And the answer is always the same. No matter what you contrast Jesus with, here's the answer. Jesus is what? Jesus is better. That's the theme of the entire book of Hebrews. And that's what, chap what verse number uh, 19 down here to verse number 21 repeats, right? Hey, we have a new and a living way. We have access. We can go boldly into the holiest. We have this new high priest. It's, it, it's all about Jesus, right? Now, here's where I love where this passage goes next. Because Jesus is better. What now? We can say it. We can know it. We can believe it. But if, or I'm going to say, since it's true that Jesus is better than whatever, than everything, Jesus is better, since that's true, what follows? And there are clearly in this passage three outcomes of that truth. Jesus is better. There's three outcomes for you and for me. And these outcomes actually are they're a command that's disguised as a suggestion. I'm going to need you to do some detective work with me. We're going to find these in the text. Have you ever heard somebody give a command, but they made it sound like a suggestion? I'm the father of four elementary age children. Sometimes in my house, you'll hear something like, why don't you pick up your room first? 
How many recognize that sounds like a suggestion, but it's kind of like a parent telling a kid to do something. Do you know what I mean? So in, in Greek, there's these commands disguised as suggestions. The big fancy term is hortatory subjunctions. You can ask Brother Kang about that. He'll describe hortatory subjunctions for you afterwards. But there are commands described disguised as suggestions, and they all begin the same. Let us. It's an invitation for us to do something in response to the truth that was just given. Because Jesus is better. Now, and that's where we want to focus our time this morning. The first thing you see in verse number 22, Scripture says, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our conscience sprinkled from an our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Number one, here's the first result of who Jesus is. Here's the first result. Let us draw near. Because of Jesus, you and I can draw near to God. Because of Jesus. You realize that religions around the world are seeking for an answer on how we can draw near to God. How we can make our peace with the Creator, with the Divine, with the, the other out there beyond, ultimate, whatever. And what the Bible tells us here is that because of Jesus, you and I can draw near. See, it's not merely that God's done being mad at me because of Jesus. It's not merely that I've escaped the wrath of God for my sin because of Jesus. By the way, that is true. God does judge sin with his wrath, but because of Jesus, Jesus took that wrath, and in Christ, guess what I am? If you thought forgiven, that's right, but I'm more than forgiven. You know what I am in Christ? I'm righteous. I'm not righteous, but in Christ, I'm righteous because God made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, in Jesus, I'm more than forgiven. I'm more than redeemed. I'm more than no longer under God's wrath. You know what I am? I am righteous before God, but not one I own it because of me. It's 100% because of who? It's because of Jesus. And because of Jesus, you and I can do verse number 22. I can draw near unto God. By the way, that's what we were created for. That's your destiny. That's your eternity. That's what our hearts are created to long for is that nearness with God. And the Bible says because of Jesus, you can draw near. There's several times this summer I've been away from my family, most recently, for almost two weeks. And when I get home, I have a, a, a little girl. She just turned six. She was five at the time. And when I come home, I love it when her name's Danessa. She'll come. And I love this with all my kids. And some of you, if you're a parent, you know this. And you know what? For about four hours from the time I got home to the time she needed to go to bed, she did not leave my side. She was right there. She wanted to sit on my lap. She wanted to sit by me with supper. She wanted me to hold her while I was walking from one room to the other. You know what? She, she missed Dad. And you know what? I was home, and she wanted to draw near. She wanted to be in my presence. She wanted to be on my lap. She just wanted to be around and enjoy that I was there. And you know what? That's the way I should be, and I can be with God. Why? Because of Jesus. So because of who Christ is, and because of what Christ did, what Hebrews tells us is, we can draw near unto God. I don't know if you've ever tried to hide something from God, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you have, you're not the only one. You're looking at someone who also has these feelings sometimes. You know what? God can't be real happy with me right now. God can't be real loving toward me right now. God's got to be kind of disappointed in me right now. In fact, here it is. I don't feel worthy right now. I don't feel like drawing near. If we're not careful, we'll live our life like that. There are some days I feel like, man, today if something happens, I can go to the Lord and I can pray. And then there's other days that I wake up grumpy. Like Monday through Sunday is kind of when that happens to me. And then I have coffee and life gets better, right? But Sundays, or, or maybe I do something wrong and I know I've displeased God. I've said something I shouldn't say or something. And I feel like, I don't know, can I pray right now? I don't know, can 
can I draw a knee right now? You know what the answer is always? Yes. Why? Because of Jesus. It's not because of me that I can pray. It's not based on my righteousness that I can have intercession with God uh, for someone else or access to the holiness. It's never been because of me. And if we get that, we'll understand that our relationship with God is based on the righteousness of Christ, which never changes, which will never diminish, which will never be extinguished, which will never be consumed. It's always there. And church, we can draw near unto God. Number one, because of Jesus, we can draw near. Do you see it? Verse number 22. But there's another one. Verse number 23 continues this pattern. Number 23 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Because of Jesus, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. I don't know what you think of when you think of holding something fast. It doesn't mean like holding it quickly. It means really getting a grip on it. Uh, two weeks ago, in fact, eight days ago, I was in the Grand Canyon. Trip of a lifetime. I was able to travel with several scholars and apologists and uh, theologians. And we did, for seven days, we did this huge rafting. I've never done anything like that. I can barely swim. <laughs> but we had life jackets on the whole time. But if you've ever done something where you've been in white water and you're in a raft and you're going through, everybody had cameras, like GoPros and stuff. I just had my little Android phone, but it was waterproof, and I was going to video, right? So we're, we're getting ready, and they say things like this before you go into the rapids. They're like, have two foot, have, have two places where you anchored your feet, and they have two opposing hand grip and hang on. In fact, one time our raft guide said this, if it feels like you're swimming, just keep hanging on. <laughs> the waves going over you or something else. Well, once in a while, I would only hang on with one hand and I'd have my camera in the other hand. And I'd have the camera out, a couple of guys were doing it. I, boy, I had, a, I had a good hold on that. I was holding my camera on. And then you come over and you go over this, this wall of water and then you go smashing down. You've got these huge cliffs on either side. And then you see it come. There's this big wall of water. Think, we probably should go through that. We're going to go over it or we're going to flip. It's going to be unbelievable. And that water's coming and then it breaks over the boat. And then it's, and you know what I'm doing with this hand? In fact, once we got through those rapids, I primed my fingers off. You can see like the rope lines on my hand. You know what I was doing with this hand? I was holding fast to that boat. <laughs> because I knew I didn't want to end up in the raft in the white water without that raft. I, it didn't matter if I was flying around, my feet were in the air. At the end of the day, if I landed on the raft and I held onto that rope, I was going to live. I knew that. That was my goal. I just wanted to live, right? I held fast to that boat. I was hanging on to it. It left marks in my hand because I was holding fast. You know what the Bible says? We need to hold fast to the profession of our faith. You realize nothing in this life is even close to as important as our life will come. There's nothing in this world. There's some things in this world that are very, very precious to me. Of course, my family and uh, my, my close friends and, and, and so many things are so precious to me and so meaningful to me. There's some things I like. I like, I, I like uh, maybe a car or where I live or maybe a phone. Or There's things that we like to have. But when we contrast that with eternity, there's just no comparison. There's no way, there's no way to contrast anything with infinity. It's just, it's just another level, you know? And what the Bible says here is we need to hold fast to our faith. And I'll be honest, this has been a year that has been trying for a lot of people. I don't know your story, but I know that there's a story. I know that this last year, I know people personally that aren't with us anymore. Maybe it was COVID. Maybe it was something else. But I know people that uh, the Lord took home. Sometimes it seemed like it was too young. Sometimes there's things I don't understand. Sometimes the, the job promotion doesn't go. Or I flat lose my job when I was working well. There's all kinds of things. Maybe somebody was, was cruel to me at some point, And they've never even come back and said, I'm sorry. And now they're dead. I can't even make it right. And I live with this scar in my life. There's any number of things that can cause us to waver and cause us to doubt and cause us to question. And you know what scripture says? We need to hold fast to that profession of our faith. 
what Brother Kane said a moment ago is, is true. I uh, teach apologetics. In fact, I consider myself an apologist that works here at the college. I'm privileged to do that. If you don't know what that means, that means that, means I, that I've spent a lot of my life studying reasons for our faith. So if you want to talk about manuscript evidence, you want to talk about evidence for an empty tomb or historical references of Jesus outside of the Bible, uh, man, I'd love to have a conversation with you because I spend years, years, and years studying that. And there's a lot of reasons to believe. None of that's cited here in this passage. You know why we should hold fast to the profession of our faith? Verse number 23, look what it says. Why? Because of Jesus, we can hold fast. What does that mean? For he is faithful that promised. Hey, it goes right back to Jesus, doesn't it? It wasn't because a promise was made. It was instead who made the promise that gives us the confidence to hold fast. And you know what? The moments when I need to hold fast the most, maybe the moments I feel most like wavering. On that raft when I was going down the Colorado River and we were heading into some white water, there were times when it was like a glass on top of that river. It was smoothed out. It got really deep. You got these canyons. There's birds. You could re it reflected like a mirror. It was so calm. We didn't hold on then. We'd move around, we'd like put our leg over the side of the raft or get more comfortable, get into snack bag to find a, uh, uh, some trail mix or something. Uh, but you know what? When there, were, when there was a moment of danger, that's when we had to win a whole lot. What, passage, what this passage is telling us is because of Jesus, we can hold on, we must hold on to that profession of our faith. First, we can draw near. Secondly, we can hold on. And then third, and maybe most importantly today, I don't know, look at verse number 24. Verse number 22 says, let us draw near. Verse 23 says, let us hold fast to the profession of our faith. And verse number 24, let us consider. We'll break this down a little bit more, but this is, this is really... A big part of this message, let us consider. Have you ever heard a parent tell a child that was very inconsiderate? Maybe you've said that before. Maybe you've thought that before. Uh, that was inconsiderate. Maybe you've thought that on the highway before. Driving. Or maybe watching someone in public. Somebody cut you in line. Well, that was, that was inconsiderate. Maybe use bigger words than inconsiderate. And they consider it would be one of the words that we could use, right? You know what it means if we tell if we tell a kid, hey, that was inconsiderate, that wasn't thoughtful, don't do that again. You know what we mean when we say that was inconsiderate? It, it says, you didn't think about the consequences your action would have on other people. You ate the last three cookies, and you have two siblings, that was inconsiderate, right? Why? Because you didn't consider the other people. You were just thinking about yourself, right? Isn't that the opposite of inconsiderate? That's what we mean. When we say that, you're just thinking about yourself, not thinking about the effects that your actions have on everybody else. Because of Jesus, church, look at what it says. Because of Jesus, verse number 24, let us consider one another. Let me ask you. How many times this week have you thought about someone else in this room? Consider them. See, that's part of it. Let us consider one another. We need to think about how our lives, our words, our actions affect people around us. Because you know what? They do. Your actions, your word, your faithfulness, your uh, your walk with God, they have an effect on other people around you. How many of you would be like me? Someone has impacted your life in a very significant way who probably doesn't know that they've had that type of impact on you. I can think of several. You realize you're having a huge impact on people around you? Say, oh, not me. I'm just me. No, 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 no. You have people that you know, that respect you, that care for you, that look to you. There are some people that you're one of the most influential people in their lives. It may not be a thousand. 
But we all have impact. And you know what else? Especially in a church, in a church like this, every one of us has an impact on every other one of us. In fact, I mentioned briefly earlier that I grew up in a pastor's home. My dad was a pastor of a church. And my dad used to love verse number 25. He called it the preacher's favorite verse or a pastor's favorite verse. You've heard it before, right? Look at verse number 25. Not forsaking the assembly. You could quote that, right? Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. So much the Lord as you see the day approach. You heard that before, right? And here's, my, my dad used to call it the pastor's favorite verse. Because you know what it meant? Come to church, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, the pastor's going to like that. But you know what? What this is saying here isn't necessarily come to church so that you can hear somebody preach the Bible. By the way, that's a good reason to come to church. And I hope when you come to church, somebody preaches the Bible, right? But think about the context of this verse. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It's right here connected with verse number 24. Luke 24 says, it says, let us consider one another to provoke, to love, and to good works. Have you been provoked recently? Have you seen someone provoked? Have you ever seen somebody on the news? Uh, maybe they're uh, had an altercation with a flight attendant or a flight attendant had with them or I don't know, any context. Maybe it was an exchange of law enforcement or maybe it was some security. Event. I don't know. Once in a while somebody be on the news or something and you're like, oh, they're provoked, right? Oh my goodness, what? They're provoked. And, and when we use that term, we think of somebody that just kind of flips and somebody that's just has this, 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 uh, angry fit, and they're like really provoked, and, and that's how we use it, right? Somebody cuts me off on the highway, I'm provoked. And no, I pat me on the leg, slow down, slow down, it's okay, it's okay, give me some space, okay? Get down, get back up there, and pass them again, right? They cut me off, I'm provoked. When you're provoked, the problem is you're sometimes motivated to do something you wouldn't otherwise do. I don't I don't generally go flying around somebody and pull back in right in front of them on the highway. But if I'm provoked, I might, right? I'm just being honest with you here. Do you do stuff when you're provoked that you wouldn't otherwise do? You ever say, you ever go back and say, have you said this before? I am so sorry I said that. I, I, I shouldn't have. I didn't really even mean it. I was just... I know it doesn't even make it right. I was angry. I said it. I wish I hadn't. I'm sorry. Have you ever had to say something like that? Because why? You were provoked. And when you're provoked, you do stuff you wouldn't otherwise do because you were you're provoked. This passage tells us to provoke one another. It's a command in Scripture. And clearly it doesn't mean that we need to provoke someone else to wrath, right? We're not. The goal is, and all right, see how many people you can tick off between now and lunchtime. Go, <laughs> right? That's not what it's talking about. That's not the kind of provoke. What does it say? We can provoke unto love and good works. Yeah, a Christian's not saved by good works. We know that. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But a Christian is saved to do good works. Ephesians 2, 10, right? It's all there. It's a part of that following of God. Good works. Love. Hey, how much love is evident in your life? How much good works flow from your walk with the Lord toward others? But you know what? Even bigger than that, how many people are motivated to love better because they know you? How many people are motivated to do works that glorify God more? Because they know you. Guess whose responsibility it is to provoke unto love and good works? Brother Kenny, right? Nah, not really. Like, yes, but not exclusively. It's like you, and it's me, and it's the person beside you in the chair, right? In this row. It's us. Provoke one another unto good works. Let me ask you a question. What would Hillcrest Baptist Church look like in 12 months if we got a hold of who Jesus was? Hey, 
He's the Son of God. He's divine. He fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. He died for our sin, lived a sinless life, rose from the dead. All that's true. But because of who he is, and we really got a hold of who Christ is, we drew near to God like never before because of Jesus. We held fast to the profession of our faith like never before because of Jesus. And how about number three? We didn't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. You know what we did instead? We provoked one another. Let us provoke one another to love and to good works. What would our community, our home, our individual lives, our church look like if we provoked each other regularly? By the way, Christ provoked his disciples to love and good works. The Holy Spirit has that role in our lives, indwelling us as Christians. But we need the body, don't we? We need church. We need to be together. We need each other. Christianity is not a DIY project. It's not. It's a do it with others project. And in this passage, it reminds us, hey, let's provoke one another to love and to good works. Let's bow in prayer. Father. <clears throat> We want to thank you this morning for bringing us together. Thank you for allowing us to gather here <clears throat> indoors uh, with uh, some of the comforts that I know weren't enjoyed uh, over much of the last 18 months with COVID and such. So thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for being good always and for bringing us together today. And Father, I just pray this morning that you would help us afresh and anew and perhaps even beyond any time previous in our lives. Would you give us a glimpse of who you are? Would you, from Scripture, from our understanding of biblical truth, help us to understand that because of Jesus, Jesus is better than the Old Testament, the prophets, and the angels, and the temple, and the sacrifice. Jesus is better than, than, than uh, uh, our career, and our, whatever we compare Jesus to, Jesus is better. And Father, I pray that you would help us to get a hold of that, and as a result, to draw near unto you. As a result, to hold fast to our faith. And as a result, to provoke one another, to consider, to intentionally think about to realize our uh, impact and to provoke one another <clears throat> to that love and good works. Church, I'm going to ask you to stay seated here uh, for a moment. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'll ask the pianist to come. So we move toward closing this service and uh, just play as you're ready. I just want to ask you here as we get ready to conclude to have a moment of prayer and dedication. No one looking around, I want to ask, is there anyone in the room today that does not know that Christ is your Savior? You don't know if Jesus has forgiven your sin because you never asked him to. You never received the gospel. You never accepted for you personally what he did on the cross. And you'd like to talk to somebody. I won't call you out. I won't ask you to do anything even right now. I just, for the end of the service, want to encourage you to see someone. Is there anyone in the room that would slide your hand up and say, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know what that means. I don't know if I understand the biblical understanding of the gospel. I'd love to talk to somebody if there's a private place for me to get a better understanding. Would you slide your hand up? I today would love to talk to somebody about the gospel and receiving Christ my Savior. Maybe you're here this morning and you're a Christian, you have been for a while, and it's so easy to lose our focus on Jesus and, be, and who he is and what he's done. I'm just going to ask the piano to continue to play, and I'm going to ask you personally. You don't need to leave your seat. You're welcome to come forward or find someone to pray with. But I want to ask you this question. Who is Jesus to you? Do you have the awe of Christ that the writer of Hebrews desires us to have? Better than anything, Jesus is better. And if that's true for you, how has it affected you? Specifically, do you need to take a step this morning in drawing near to God because of Jesus? Of holding fast to your faith because of Jesus? or considering one another to provoke
devote to love and good works because of Jesus. Father, you know that my heart has been challenged and convicted from the text this morning, both in preparation and our time together. Lord, I pray that you would help this to be true in my life, in and every life here. God, we know we can't. We know we're not going to be good at it. We know we're going to fail if we try on our own. But we want to offer ourselves as a church and as individuals this morning. Lord, we're willing for you to be greater in our lives than anything else. May, us, may we, Lord, grasp who you are. And Father, I pray that you'd help us. to, Because of that, as that is our foundation, to draw near to you, hold fast to our faith, and to consider one another. Yeah, we're going to assemble, but I pray that we would assemble and consider. We're going to be around each other, but I pray that we would provoke each other to love and good works. And Lord, as we do that, I believe you'll receive glory. Father, I pray your blessing on this church. We pray that you would continue to provide and guide as you have in the past. And we'll thank you for bringing us together this morning. In Christ's name. going to be in the back if anyone wants to speak with him or talk to him or just, just show your appreciation for him coming out here today. We also have coffee and donuts. I see our back. Uh, we just bought another 150 cups, uh, cups of coffee. So go back there and have some coffee and donuts. Uh, provoke one another today. Uh, let's lean on each other uh, and work together. Uh, a couple more announcements that Brother Nathan didn't get to. We have a woman's uh, fellowship coming up on the uh, 7th. There's a sign up in the back. It's at Tanaka Farms. Go ahead and put your name on that. Um, there is a small cost associated with that, and we're trying to get people to carpool together out to Tanaka Farms, and that would be a blessing. And just one more thing I'd like to say about the, the opportunities for prayer. Uh, 1 John 5.14 says that, that the confidence we have in approaching God, and in that confidence, if we ask according to the will of God, He will hear us. Not, not that he may hear us, or he might hear us, or he'll look the other way, but that he will hear us. And I think that's a very, very important point in, in 1 John, that we need to come together as a church in confidence and pray for his will. And those opportunities are back there. One of the opportunities is a men's and women's prayer group, and what we're doing, my wife and I are putting it together on Saturday mornings at 8.30 at my house, uh, for the women, and the Saturday mornings at 8.30 um, at the pastor's house. Now, those of you who didn't know, Pastor Choi's house, the church board decided to keep renting that house in his absence. I'm uh, using that as a church office, a place where we can store our stuff. I go in there and check on it during the week. Nathan stays in when he's preparing some of his messages. We're going to start using that as a meeting place. So Saturday mornings at 8.30 for the men. Come and see me. Put your name on the back, and we'd like to start that um, after that, we usually go out and canvas at 10 o'clock, so that would be a perfect time if you want to go out and canvas, if you don't. But I think it's very important that we come together as a church um, in, in many ways possible, and this is just one of the, the ways. Also, Sunday mornings here at 9.30, and just get on our knees together corporately before the Lord and pray um, where he's uh, leading us, and, and pray for that family that he's leading to us. Um, we know that there's a family out there right now. There's a husband and there's a wife uh, looking for a church. Uh, they may know they're coming out here. They may, they may be in a different country right now. Only God knows that. And I think that if we connect corporately in prayer and pray for God's will, he hears us. Uh, anything else you have for the board members, uh, come and see me or the other board members. I see both of them are here today. Uh, ask any questions about this ongoing process that we have uh, as we continue to pray and search for a pastor. And um, uh, I think we will, uh, we will find one and we will do it together as a church, as a family. Um, one final song, if you all will stand up, we're going to sing one final song, Standing on the Promises, and then we'll be dismissed.